So I got kind of the impression from your IMDb bio that you are a little bit method. Uh, you became a boxer for Risen. You became a reverend for the reverend. How did you prepare for this role? Because <laughs> <laughs> This is David Stark from Watcher Pass. Today I'm talking to Stuart Brennan, the star of Stalker, which is coming to theaters and on demand on March 31st, 2023. We're going to talk to him right now. And while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. I'll smell a lot. Thank you. So thanks so much for joining me. This is Stuart Brennan, the star of Stalker, which is coming to theaters and on demand on March 31st, 2023. It is a tense thriller with a really nice buildup and a, a very interesting kind of shocking twist. Uh, I am very excited to talk to you. I really love kind of your performance and the chemistry that you had. So uh, I'm really excited to hear more about it. And thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me here. So of course. excited to talk about this film. It's been uh, a really exciting project to be involved in from the start. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I guess that would be the the first question. Always a good kind of softball question. How did you get involved in this film? How did it come across your desk? And, uh, you know, what appealed to you about Daniel, the character that you play? So COVID obviously changed how everyone worked for a good few months back there in 2020. And uh, my production company, Stronghold, we started looking for films that were minimal cast, minimal locations. And we came across this incredible writer called Chris Watt. Um, and we actually optioned one of his screenplays, uh, which was about a recluse musician. And um, while we were developing that screenplay with him, he mentioned he'd written this horror film. And would I like to have a read of that? I thought, sure, why not? You know, I'm not doing much else these days. So we <laughs> I read it and it was um, originally called Freight, about a freight elevator. And as I read this, it had a number of other characters in there and um, there are a few other locations, but what was jumping off the page was this dialogue was just electric and the general vibe of the script was really intriguing and kept me reading from the first page to the last. Mm -hmm. And with any project I'm looking to produce, first and foremost, I generally look at it as an actor and say, is this a role I'd like to commit, you know, a year of my life to? And this Daniel was just so interesting. He was so creepy, but principled and um, clumsy, but smooth. He just, <laughs> he was he just a, a bundle of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I pulled Chris up and I said, hey, look, what do you think about trying to condense this down? So it's just one location with basically two actors. Um, and he said, yeah, I love the idea. And he said, why do you want to do that? And I said, because of the challenge. I think the challenge of this is to make it as gripping as possible. And when you start with essentially two actors in one location, immediately everyone's sort of eyebrow goes up and you think to yourself, oh, how good is this going to be? Mm -hmm. That's, let's start there. Let's start with a huge challenge for us to work on together. And he rose to that challenge and we got Steve Johnson had won an award at the British Independent Film Festival and uh, we've been talking about doing a project together and I sent him this screenplay and he leapt at the chance and said yes please. So he then got involved in the um, development of the piece as well. And so as a kind of small core unit we started moving together through this this process of developing it and just trying to apply kind of you know every I think seven pages, we try and get a scare in there because we'd heard that's what Blumhouse are doing at the moment. I thought that's quite <laughs> smart. They make some nice movies. And um, just little things like that where we we just gave these characters great arcs, um, made sure there was conflict driving every scene. And and then we, we moved into production. So I love that you mentioned the writing and how like how electric it was. I I love the writing. I thought it was fantastically written. Like there were so many moments when there would be like some line that has like a like a cheeky like second meaning or some other meaning. And I would just smile like throughout. And you know, the, the at the end of the day, this is a, a film about essentially two people stuck in an elevator, which can either be really bad if you know the characters aren't fun and the writing's not good and you're not following, along, or it can be really good, like in this one, where you just really enjoy learning about you know, seeing their interplay, wondering like what will happen next, seeing like the cat and mouse game that's going on. And so, yeah, that, that definitely was something that, uh, that jumped out to me. I'm so glad. Yeah, Chris did such an excellent job. And and as 
actors then dealing with the screenplay, it was such a joy to work with because there is so much subtext um, and there are callbacks to different things or, or things with, with double or sometimes triple meanings, which on the first time you read it, you only pick up on sort of 50% of them. And then as Sophie and I rehearsed it, we would rehearse each evening and each morning when we were shooting. Um, and Gareth Wiley, our exec producer, has won a Golden Globe for Vicky Cristina Barcelona and done four movies with Woody Allen. He would he would give us some coaching uh, in those rehearsals and we get to explore this beautiful text. And uh, it was really fun. It reminded me very much of kind of working with Shakespeare, where there's so many hidden things going on. You really need to get to grips with it before you even try and start getting it on its feet. And that's really the approach we took with this was very much a rehearsal orientated process before we then stepped into the onto the stage, if you like. So I, I love that you are rehearsing a movie where you in it you also rehearse lines so it's like very meta but <laughs> it really is isn't it <laughs> uh but yeah no, i love i love like the subtext i think one of my favorite lines is is when you know they're talking and uh sophie's character says like i'm kind of a people watcher and your character's like oh me too and i was like oh god that's such a great line for this film that's so fantastic <laughs> it is isn't it and there's yeah. a number of those throughout which yeah yeah it's really cool exactly and, uh, and so much so oh. much of that was there at the beginning as well Mm -hmm. it, it really you know i take my hat off to chris it was really he is a wonderful writer yeah for sure and i like how you mentioned you know you only picked up some of it on the first read and had to read it again because that definitely was my experience as well i picked up a good amount on the first watch but then i always watch again before an interview and you know a few things here and there also kind of trickled out so it gives you kind of a nice thing to uh look forward to if you do decide to watch it twice oh definitely and you know what we we took the approach when we were working on on a lot of the design elements uh, we have an in-house uh, costume team in Stronghold who work on development from a very early stage. And so just things like the costumes we have um, with Daniel, he's kind of like a wasp. Starts off with a military vibe to give himself some sort of presence and danger. And then he becomes uh, like a wasp. You know, he's got a sting potentially under there. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Rose is, of course, quite like a rose if you look at her costume design. You look at the design of the elevator and there's um, a confession booth vibe going on to it with these sort of dark crimson applic sort of colors uh, even the tone of the wood they've gone that to that level of depth in terms of the design elements they've put together um, and all the way through yeah there's lots of little things that you'll you can draw upon on second or even third viewings um, so yeah I'm, I'm thrilled that that you looked at it a second time and i, I really look forward to hearing what other things people discover for sure and i like the the confession booth uh you know statement that you made because I, I didn't notice it but what i did notice is a lot of the shots you'd have like only one character which i think also kind of draws that comparison also you'd only be able to see like one character as they were talking you wouldn't get to see both of them and it really focused you on that person and what they're saying and things like that so yeah and i think that was a mixture of steve's direction and then mark wake who was the editor and grader on the film uh, as he was editing through, he he took a fantastic approach of saying, who's got the power at this moment? Mm -hmm. And that would then dictate who we're watching and, and why the camera's moving. And it, it gives it that cat and mouse feel all the way through, because sometimes you're favoring one character, sometimes you're favoring the other. And then at other moments, you've got both of them and you just have to watch and let it play out. And that... Um, that I think is is really the beating heart of the movie and why it plays so well, because you are constantly on your toes. For sure. And um, you mentioned the writing and, and how much you love the script. And I I'm always curious, especially a movie that is conversational, like how much did you improv? How much did you stick to the script? Was it kind of, you know, pretty much by the script and then occasionally you'd have some flourishes here and there just to make the characters, you know, transitions cleaner like was there any amount of improv or did you kind of stick closely to what was written just because of the way you know because you liked it so much that's a great question and we pretty much are verbatim oh, wow. yeah that's i'm amazing. trying to think if we i think we tweaked a few little things towards the end of the film that just helped the pace or mm -hmm. helped give it a, a little bit more of an edge to whichever character was kind of taking the limelight at that stage but they were all very minor and always done with the 
utmost consideration for Chris and the rest of the script. We didn't want to mess anything up by suddenly changing something and then, you know, hear him say, no, it ruins this moment. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were very respectful, I think. Um, yeah, and I think because we rehearsed it so heavily, we really were able to iron out any kinks before we got to set. So then once we were on set, um, I think we did something like eight or nine days before one of us even had a, a stumble on a line, oh, which wow. is just normally unheard of. You know, you do two or three takes for an actor normally um, in any scene, but we were just nailing that dialogue again and again um, because we loved it so much. That is that is amazing. And also, you know, very important for an indie film when you don't have a ton of time, a ton of budget. And if this was filmed during COVID, you're also just kind of like worried about the number of days you have to shoot just in general because someone could get sick, something could go wrong. So that, that's amazing that you were able to get just so cleanly move through the uh, the shooting phase. Thanks. Yeah, I think COVID helped because we were shooting in this incredible manor house uh, called Dunskay. It's the Dunskay estate in Scotland um, in a place called Port Patrick. It's a beautiful location and the hosts, uh, Anne and Ali there, are just really wonderful people who are very supportive of anyone who's trying to do something creative. And so we were able to hold the whole crew up there um, and both um, Sophie and I were there and essentially locked in for that two week period to shoot the film over about, I think we did 11 or 12 days of filming over, over two weeks. Um, so it was really intense, but it meant that we all ate together we all hung out together in the evenings um and then we could get up early and, and do um the rehearsals that we were putting in um and going to bed late with a scottish whiskey while rehearsing <laughs> scripts that for me that's kind of the dream <laughs> yeah no it sounds like uh it would be a vacation if you weren't working all the time but it sounds like it could have been a little bit of both <laughs> i think it always should be a bit of both you know yeah. if you can manage it <laughs> and then, uh, for sure also and also during covid i've talked to a lot of people who said like you know when we were finally able to get out and do a project and we went through all the protocols to make sure everyone was safe and like following uh you know all of our cautionary protocols like it was great because then you could finally kind of let your guard down for this little bit of time because you knew that everyone in there you know was safe and it also had, was committed to staying that way so that the project would go forward yeah i i think it, it definitely helped the focus for everyone and and you did get that sense of being lucky to be doing your job at a time when so many other people not just can't do their jobs, but also, uh, uh, you know, struggling to breathe or, or very, very sick um, or losing loved ones. And, and here we are getting to do our job, which is always a dream. And we, we were kind of got a chance to step out of the COVID world for, for a few weeks. So yeah, it was a real blessing. And um yeah, I guess I I've done two I did two films during COVID and both experiences were really positive and really wonderful. And and I think a lot of the pressures that you normally face in intense situations like filming were I guess shouldered better by everyone. You know, anyone who would maybe speak up a little bit um because they don't like the catering or something, uh chose not to. Yeah. Because they knew they were lucky to be here. So yeah that's awesome to hear i mean hopefully that is all behind us you know i guess we'll find out as time goes on but uh that's that's great to hear that you were able to kind of make it work and also enjoy the experience during that time yeah definitely yeah let's hope that's well behind us i think for everyone's sake. um so i got kind of the impression from your imdb bio that, bio that you were a little bit method uh you became a boxer for risen you became a reverend for the reverend how did you prepare for this role? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was difficult. And <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It, it definitely put a strain on, on my personal relationships a little bit because you're going to a dark place each day. Mm -hmm. And I think I struggled initially with trying to connect with the character uh, until one day just a very simple thought crossed my mind um which is on instagram or any social media you're looking at on your phone have you ever zoomed in on a photo oh yeah for sure right everyone's done it yep. um that is the equivalent 
in a way of getting into Daniel's world. He's looked at something and zoomed in on it. And that's something we're all capable of, whether or not it's something we should be zooming in on or not, or it's just pure curiosity that's driving that impulse. Um, it's not what was intended when somebody put that picture up, otherwise they would have zoomed in on it. Mm -hmm. So you're now walking this fine line between what people want, what people expect, what people are putting out there, and then how it's being engaged with. I thought, wow, okay, that's really interesting. And that, to go down a dark path with it is very easy because you're like, right, yeah, there's lots of things that I think are, are wrong to be doing. But at the same time, you you won't get very far if you try and delve into a character's darkness because I don't think anyone thinks they're inherently evil. So what I took from that was curiosity. Mm -hmm. He's curious. And he takes pride in his thorough research that he does on any topic. His topic just happens to be a person. And that starts going down a very slippery slope. So, but by doing that and becoming so obsessed with something, you start shutting off the world around you. And I think um, then we also can point at that person and say they're weird because they're not uh, contributing to society in the same way as, as other people or, or being a member of a team or um, the life and soul of the party. They're on the outskirts of, of society. And, you know, that's a judgment from other people. That's certainly not a judgment he's putting on himself because if you expel all of that and just go, well, hold on, what is driving this character? He's a curious person, but mm -hmm. what, what else is going on in his world? His mother's sick. If you've got a sick family member, you care for them. That makes you a caring person. And it also centers your world around something that nobody else can see. So yes, you don't stay for drinks after work because you've got to get home, because you've got to get home to care for someone. And actually that's quite a stress and a burden that you're carrying because by the time the day finishes, you've got to get home. Mm -hmm. And even if you're trying to do your dream job, it's a long road. And that gets brought up in some of the dialogue around how long he's been at his lower level job. And, you know, he gets teased for it, which he doesn't respond well to because none of us would. No one likes to be teased for something they're trying to put real effort into, especially when they've got other burdens in their world that are holding them back. So you start finding all these things that you can really sympathize with and empathize with. And that's where I found the core of Daniel. He's a, a genuinely nice person, but some of the things he's doing, he could really do with some guidance around um, and perhaps some advice on what he should be looking at and shouldn't be looking at and boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and you, yeah, you, you kind of, he starts becoming a very formed person that way. Yeah. And I, I like kind of your approach to this because it does make him relatable, understandable, however you want to call it. Cause you know, he, he, you start from like a, something that a lot of, you know, probably everyone has done. A lot of us have done is just kind of like you see something and you zoom in to kind of see some more detail. And then you just take that to an extreme with Daniel. And he is again, trying to see a detail for, you know, what his purpose is for his own uh, purposes, because he has no other option, whatever you want to phrase it. But then that kind of like leads you down this rabbit hole to how he can go from nice guy to, you know, nice ish guy with very kind of creepy obsessive personality issues like it, it kind of leads you down that that path yeah definitely and it it's really sad in a way that we're so judgmental about people who are struggling to communicate with other people and i think that's really where i started finding knowing that this was an important character to get right and to make three-dimensional rather than just make him feel like a baddie um you know the movie's called stalker so somebody's going to be the stalker and when there's only two characters it's pretty easy to start singling yourself out as that that bad character and when i spoke to a member a number of the team everyone who'd read the script said oh i hate daniel i hate daniel and it really got to me and I was like, no, you can't, you can't hate him. Like not from, especially, you know, we haven't even seen him yet. Um, and so that 
yeah, made me just try and find anything I could that I could grip onto to make him a bit more relatable or a bit bit more understated as well. Um, so even his voice, I worked really hard on on trying to find the right voice for him. And I had to come up with uh, a kind of key word that would let me into the way he speaks because he talks very differently from me. And so I would, um, I think I drove some of the cameramen mad because every time before we do a take, I just have to remind myself of the voice so that it would be natural and fluid. So literally you've got the camera all set up here and I would just be saying this one word, which was roll. roll. And for some reason, when I say the word roll, 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 <laughs> there's crazy. Daniel's voice and Daniel's That's voice crazy. just comes out <laughs> and all the mannerisms with him and everything starts coming with it. And, um, I hadn't explained this to anyone. So the camera team were thinking to themselves, why does he keep saying roll? Like, yeah, we're gonna, we're going to roll. We're rolling the cameras. Like, just give us a second, but I'd always be there kind of roll, roll, roll. <laughs> so I'm trying to get the voice to kick in. So um, but yeah, and I, you know, I just found that gave him less of an edge and made him a bit softer. And uh yeah, it was great fun. And it's funny, that's the that's the first time I've done the voice since filming, because I after shooting the movie, I don't like the character mm -hmm. and I don't like him and I don't like him in my world. And uh, I had to live with him for a while and now I'm quite happy being gone of him. So yeah, I'd never even do the voice anymore. That's, that's amazing. Also, I do love that like role is like, it's a soft word. It sounds like a soft word, but then when you say it with the way that your, your voice emphasizes the R and the role, it like, it turns it into more sinister of a voice. And I, I could definitely kind of hear Daniel when you said it just then. That was, that was crazy. Oh, cool. Thank you. But I also think like, you know, to your point about you trying to like really flesh it out and find points like that is kind of you know, the triumph of your, per, you know, your depiction of him in this film is like, you're, you're right. This movie's called stalker. You can kind of guess who the, the antagonist is going to be with the characters. And like, everything is geared towards you not liking him, but there are definitely times when you feel pity for him, when you feel like sympathy for him, when you're like, oh, he is kind of a nice person. Like that is a, a wonderful layer for this. And it kind of makes this interaction interesting. If it was just like, okay, he's a bad person and we're waiting for him to kind of, you know, strike, then that is not a very interesting horror movie. It could be a tense horror movie, but it's not very interesting. But, you know, the way that you kind of gave him additional aspects really does help uh, with the character development also makes this whole conversation and elevator interesting so oh thank you so much that means the world to me because yeah that was that was the challenge the, you know the first time i read that screenplay was you've got to keep keep everyone guessing and on a page that actually works really well but the moment you start trying to bring it to life if anything feels a bit false you've lost the audience because either they'll get bored and that's so easy to do in in this sort of film um, or you'll start giving clues mm -hmm. and you shouldn't ever give clues in a film like this. They all need to be red herrings or, um, or leading in terms of building to a scare or getting the audience uncomfortable. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I also, you know, it sounds like you and Sophie had really great chemistry just because you were rehearsing all the time. Did you do anything to build before your kind of like, I don't know, film retreat to this Scottish manner or uh, was, was there anything that you were able to do beforehand or did you just kind of like jump in and you're like, okay, we're going to start rehearsing. Cause this is also a film where like it, you can start off not having chemistry at the start because you're not supposed to have chemistry when they first get in the elevator and then you can kind of build as the film progresses. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, no, we didn't meet until filming. So literally we had maybe two days before we started filming. Um, when we got to the location so we met and said hello and I, I was familiar with her work and um you know excited to be working with her and I just took the initiative and, and went up and said hey I, I, I really like to rehearse quite a bit before we do the scene just so we can play with it and explore and, and maybe find some ways not to do it and, and then hopefully hit on the the right way to do the scene um, and she said, oh, that's great. That's what I love to do too. So, so let's grab five minutes. So we, we almost immediately grabbed a coffee and, and took the script and started playing with it. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we did some rehearsals as well, and it was coming together. 
it was really the first day of filming that that galvanized us though because steve for better or worse basically said well let's let's see it and one it was one of the it was the entrance to the elevator in that opening scene uh in the elevator and i was kind of like a bit thrown by this and said uh, how, how do you mean because it's not a stage play this is quite a technical process and we've got the cameras and things uh, well what do you mean and and he said well it's just just play play it you know however you feel like and, and which kind of gave us an awkward tension which was great and worked really well um but we then played the scene and we played about 10 minutes of that of the film if you like oh. and 10 minutes is a really long time to go for any take let alone a rehearsal because ultimately you know the, the camera you're going to cut and that sort of thing so as a film actor you don't come prepared for for a long take like that unless you're sort of told in advance and everyone's on the same page but then we did this rehearsal he said okay great well we're going to set up the camera and then when we were getting ready he said right we'll, we'll do that whole piece again so uh, another t whole 10 minute okay okay and then pretty much the whole day we did whole 10 minute takes from each angle wow and that's pretty brutal because you're you're trying to hit every single mark exactly the same every single time mm -hmm. and also keep the intensity which on long takes it can start to go especially if you're doing the same bit again um but i i enjoyed it and i think sophie enjoyed it too and then afterwards we kind of said we need to rehearse tomorrow if we're going to do the same thing because the film literally as you go up the levels it gets more and more intense yeah. and that will become a huge acting challenge to be able to keep that intensity hit every single mark hit all the subtext and the beats on every single line every single time and yeah, she she was like, yeah, I'm I'm totally game. She said, I'll I'll stay up as long as it takes. And I said, well, I'm an early riser as well when I'm filming, so I'll, I'll be up kind of five a.m. Um, she's like, great, I'll be there. Wow. I said, okay, because I've heard that before. And uh, no, every every morning five a.m. I'd make the fire. They had these huge, great big fireplaces at Dunskay. I'd make a fire going, um, and then she'd come down and we'd sit there for about four hours rehearsing until um nine would grab a quick bite to eat and then we're straight into costume and on set um and when we finished we'd finish at filming about six um have some dinner and then straight back into rehearsing usually till about midnight one o'clock and that just that's, gave us that that strength together yeah that that sounds exhausting but you know i guess the, the proof is in the pudding right like that sounds very difficult especially when you don't have any time to rest because you have a you know, limited shooting time, but uh, you know, the, the result is on screen. So I guess it works. It just sounds like a very exhausting vacation as I described it earlier. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It, do you know what it was, but I look back on it really uh, fondly working with Sophie in that environment because you never really get this opportunity as a film actor. You end up rarely getting a chance to rehearse. Mm -hmm. Often the other actors don't want to, for whatever reason. And the joy is really in, in nailing your performance each time. And when you feel like you're doing something special, you want to keep it going. And yeah, it, it was long hours. It was hard work, but she's a lot of fun to be around. So it was always just highly enjoyable. And having someone like Gareth Wiley as well, because Gareth's so experienced and he's got such a great eye for detail. You know, you, you think of the actors he's worked with, everyone from Scarlett Johansson to Hugh Jackman, let alone Woody himself. He can just tweak a performance so effortlessly with just a couple of questions that that kind of keeps you on your toes as well and um, just allowed us to really give everything we had. So just a heads up, we get into spoilers in this next question. So if you want to know more about the film, I'm going to move this question to the end. So just kind of keep watching till the end of the interview to learn more about the ending. So I know you have limited time, so I'm going to switch. So I call it the lightning round. They're just very lightweight questions about the film. I want to see how your personal experiences map to things that happened in the movie. You can feel free not to answer them. I will uh, not be offended, but I try to keep them very answerable. Okay. First question is, have you ever been trapped in an elevator or some sort of enclosed space? 
I have. I've been uh, trapped in an elevator. I can't remember where in the world I was, but it was um, for about two hours, and it was oh not fun. Gosh. Yeah, that yeah. sounds terrible. And you survived, so that's good, right? I survived. I think they fixed it and just <laughs> came down, doors opened, and no explanation. Oh, wow. Um, uh, Sophie's character had a trick that she had for new places to kind of, uh, I don't know, ease some of the attention. Do you have any sort of tricks that you have for new places? It could be, you know, like rituals that you do or just anything like some sort of like thing that you always start off with when you go to a new place. I love the stars. If, I, if I'm anywhere, I always try and seek out the stars at night. That always sort of centers me and gives me just a connection with back home. So, uh, yeah, whenever each each night, I generally go out and just look at the stars just for a little bit, let the dog out and just chill out on the porch for a, for a while. Um, and I kind of do that whenever I'm traveling as well. So, yeah, chilling out with the stars. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, a flask plays a key role in this film. Do you have a flask? <laughs> I do. I'm a huge whiskey fan. Oh, so, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do have a cheeky flask. And fun <laughs> note. Um, Sophie is a huge whiskey fan as well. And it was my birthday while filming. So on, on one of the days uh, where, where the flask is being used, it is actually uh, full of uh, a rather nice dram of Scottish whiskey. Wow. That, uh, so you're like, oh, we got to do another take of this. I, <laughs> I didn't get it right this time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the next question was, I loved your character's glasses. I was going to ask you your glasses, but clearly you do. So uh, that, that, that's an easy answer. I do, but you know, they're actually fake glasses and yeah. I'm wearing contacts. Oh, um, wow. Because we went for a, a different pair of glasses than I normally wear. And um, that's what the costume designer, uh, Ruth, wanted. So, yeah. So, ironically, I'm wearing fake glasses. That I mean, that makes sense, right? For a you know, costume person to have just regular glass, because then, like you said, she can just use it for any future movie and doesn't need to kind of change the prescription, which I imagine is difficult. Yeah, and I think as well, I think they got two pairs in case one broke. Um, and yeah, it, I guess it does make sense. Um, it is funny. I, I, I enjoy wearing glasses. I'm really quite short-sighted. And it's often been a benefit to me um, because if I need to, I guess, just zone out a little bit and just focus on, on, on me during a performance. If I take my glasses off, I can't see anything. I can't see the camera. I can't see the crew. So, um, every now and again, I find it's got great benefits. That is, that is awesome. Yeah. You're like in your own special like bubble, essentially. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. I just wear them because I think it makes me look smart. So yeah, it, it does. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, do you have a fancy camera, like a really nice high quality camera? I imagine you probably do just hazard of the trade, but just, uh, you know, curious um no not uh no i don't think i do actually um i i did i've got a really nice canon 5d mark iii and thinking i'll take all these great pictures with it and just never used it um so i, I gave it to one of my brothers yeah and now i i just have my iphone um which takes you know pretty good pictures and yeah i don't have one it is nice to just have all the pictures in your pocket and you don't have to like transfer things over or fiddle with any sort of setting. That is very nice about the iPhones. Yeah. I, do you know what? I, I live so much in the moment. I really try and um, I work so much throughout the year that whenever I'm doing something fun, I just like to put technology down and just enjoy it. And so I rarely take pictures. And that's what I found by having my own camera with my own lenses and things. I was either working and when I wasn't, I just wanted to enjoy the people around me rather than snapping away. So, yeah, it's uh, not so I'm, uh, anyone who's a behind the scenes photographer is in no danger from me stealing their job. That's for sure. <laughs> yet. 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 Yeah. Um, I have two minutes and 45 seconds left on my Zoom call. So if it cuts out, it is not being rude. It's Zoom kicking me off. So just my give me a heads up. Sure. Um, next question is, do you. Was there a B-roll camera operator in Stalker? And do you know that person's name? The, in the crew, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Wendo. All right. Yeah, he was our, our BTS guy. Awesome. So if he got in an elevator with you, you would recognize him and it wouldn't be weird. So that'd be perfect. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the last question is, have you ever had a Stalker? Oh, no, I've... 
No. At, at least not that you know of, I guess. So. Not that I know of, or not that could be classed as stalking, I don't think. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've had a stalker. Well, that, 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 that's a good answer yes that perfect yeah <laughs> uh so the film is out on march 31st 2023 in theaters and on demand you're out promoting it to gain the word out but after this is out after people see you in stalker what can they look forward to uh next from you and your production company war chief so war chief is coming in the fall uh via lionsgate and it, this is an orc thriller oh well so it's, my attention. Uh, yeah, it's a fantasy film set 100,000 years ago with a group of uh, guardians and a messenger trying to get a message to the king and orcs attack. So we've been very fortunate to work with some of the best in the business and have created these most incredible orcs, um, all with SFX. So uh, it's really old school, but uh, it's a, a really exciting film. So I'm um, we're just going on to to a spin-off of that film actually at the moment that I start shooting in a couple of weeks. So it's a really, really exciting time. Well, that is awesome. That is definitely not what I expected, but uh, sounds fantastic. Um, this is Stuart Brennan, the star of Stalker, which is coming to theaters and on demand on March 31st, 2023. You can check it out uh, in theaters or the comfort of your own home, and then you can check out War Chief later this year. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, mate. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Uh, thank you, David. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Bye. awesome uh and i do want to ask quickly uh about the ending there will be spoilers I'll, i will put this at the end of the uh of the interview so that you know people can like uh skip ahead or you know, skip it if they don't want to but so after seeing it twice like <laughs> i still don't exactly know you know the ending was kind of structured interestingly where it go with it almost I, I, I could think of like two things either it's like jumping in time so it jumps to like a later time and the earlier time it kind of like coalesces at the pivotal scene or one is like the movie interpretation of what happened and the other is like the real life interpretation and they kind of meet at the end do you have a, a sense of that or is it just kind of like you, you know it is what it is and, and people can take their own uh their own you know explanations as they will that's really fun that you you look at it like that that's interesting so when we did the first edit, um, it was linear. And the problem is, because of the ending, when the chopping happens, <laughs> that's such an emotional high for the audience that actually then killing someone um, doesn't actually top the chopping. So yeah. you kind of have a high point, then the film goes like that, then it ends. And you don't really want your audience here at the end of the film. And so I pointed this out to, to Steve and the editor and suggested, in fact, that the editor has a play and chops this up. And we try and get kind of three layers going simultaneously that give us those sort of one, two, three hits at the end, which is that he's essentially caught, cut, killed. And that should leave us on a punch. And so he he just took it and, and and essentially found a way to stagger it and then use the grade to differentiate between the three. So really one is kind of the continuation of the end. One is the middle time going through as she's toying with him essentially. And then the finale is, is leading up to the kill. Um, so yeah, that's how it, how the ending plays out. So it's really interesting to hear how you can look at that from different ways when I know it is just the linear oh awesome okay yeah because with the, the grade change i was like okay this looks manifestly different from the other like the other more i don't know normal scene so i'm wondering if this is like you know ha has a hollywood glamour on it or something so that that's interesting well uh, I, I, that was one thing i was thinking i, I wasn't 100 percent sure but i do agree that like with the chopping and then the killing uh, when he was killed i was almost like oh you know like he's pretty much already dead so it's yeah. <laughs> it's not not that big of a difference for him so. it's not been a good day at the office for him no, that's for sure definitely not <laughs> that was Stuart Brand, the star of stalker which is coming to theaters and on demand on march 31st 2023 it is a well-done indie thriller that has a nice build-up and a pretty shocking twist if you like this interview please like and subscribe to this channel it helps me out a lot make sure all my new content goes straight to you thank you mm -hmm.